excited that tomorrow is Friday. And somebody tell me, what is special about Monday? No school. Um, we celebrate Martin Luther King Day. And because of that, it is a no school, um, it is a holiday. But it is a holiday because we celebrate Martin Luther King Day. I want to remind some of you as I'm looking around that you should have your AirPods out, your earbuds out, and your phones put away, please and thank you. On this day, our capture question up on the board that you should be writing down in your notebook. Again? Write it on your hand. Um, you have your capture question. It says, how is it possible to have a volcano located in the middle of a tectonic plate? How is it possible when we know that most volcanoes are located at the plate boundaries, how is it possible to have a volcano located right in the middle of the plate? So that is what you are going to be talking about um, today. Our content objectives for today, it says students are going to review where volcanoes are located around the globe and learn how different volcanoes form. What are we going to do? We're going to describe the landforms created by different types of magma, such as felsic magma and mafic magma. And that has to do with silica and um, basalt. Yes, we do have a quiz today. It is a four-point quiz on plate boundaries. Can someone remind me? What are the three plate boundaries that we've talked about? Give me one. Transform, give me another one. Divergent, give me the last. Convergent. And so that is what we are going to be doing um, today. You almost ready? Let's go ahead. I'm going to give you some time to write down this question. I know some of you were gone yesterday, so this will be good review for you. This quiz today has nothing to do with how volcanoes are made, anything like that. We're going to have some notes on that today. So the quiz is only on plate boundaries that we have been um, talking about. The only person in here that is exempt from that quiz is guess who? Me. No. It's our new student, Lex. Uh, Alexis, or Lex. No, why would you be exempt? Because I wasn't here. And what did I just say? I don't know. And I know. It has, nothing, it has nothing to do with um, what we did yesterday. We're just going to be quiet for a minute. Just a minute. Ta. You're not doing it yet? Trying to keep you on track. Good job. Appreciate that about you. All right. If we could now, I'm going to go ahead and put some time on the clock. You have 32 seconds to turn with your pair share partners and share out. If we know most volcanoes are located at the plate boundaries, how in the world can we possibly get one in the middle of a plate? And your time starts now. Go. Lexi, I'm so sorry that everything is Maya, make sure that you include our good friend. Look at it. 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 Look at what do we think? How is it possible to have a volcano located in the middle of a plate? Billy, would you mind turning it this way? Did you already? So let's imagine that we've got a plate that looks like this. Okay, it's a big, huge plate, and we know most volcanoes happen at the edges because this plate is open or cracked at the edge. That makes sense because then magma can come up and it can form a volcano. But if we look and have a volcano right in the middle, that's away from the plate boundaries. That shouldn't be there. So how then do we have volcanoes in the middle? Asa, get us started. Um, my thought was chemical composition can like, uh, melt through the crust and let magma. Okay. What did we learn yesterday about um, those kinds of um, areas? Uh, will. Uh, magma, plumes. magma plumes. And so let's talk about a magma plume. So what is, Will, a magma plume? It is a volume of lava going upwards. 
Yeah, it is a large, massive, if you will, volume of magma that rises up. We don't know why now it rises up. We don't know why there's this big column or amount of magma that rises up from certain areas in the earth and it rises up and pushes on the crust. This then creates cracks, creates cracks, I know I'm sorry I'm blocking, and openings for magma, magma. This creates volcanoes. An example would be Hawaii. Hawaii is an example. Has anybody been to Hawaii? Was it lovely? Was it or not? Was it? What island did you go to? Do you remember? Did you go to any of the other islands? Was it like the big island of Hawaii or? Did you really go to Hawaii? Mm -hmm. How old were you? Six. Oh, so it was a long time ago. So magma plumes. Now, what that happens is, um, if we, I want to show you a picture before we move on from this. I want to show you a picture about this from yesterday. All right, I'm going to turn off the front lights. And I want to show you what we got going. Yep. What we have on here is we've got the main island of Hawaii, and then you've got seven, I believe, other little um, island volcanoes that are part of the Hawaiian Ridge. If you look up here, you've got what's called the Emperor Sea Mount Chain. A sea mount is not an island. A sea mount is an island that has got worn down through weathering and is now a big mountain underwater, but it's no longer sticking up. Okay, so if we look at this and we say to ourselves, this was the original or this isn't the original, this is where that hot spot is located, and I'll just say hot spot. How then, because yesterday part of um, our packet was asking how does a hot spot or a magma plume help us to track plate movement? Could you turn that back this way? Billy, can you turn that back this way? So how does a hot spot or a magma plume help us to track the plate movement? How do we look at this and know which way this plate is moving? And I'm going to go ahead and put a compass rose on there for you, north, south, east, west. With your pair shirt partners, look at what we have on here and let's see if you can figure out how or where this plate, the Pacific plate, is tracking. Turn and talk that out. Go. to be coming up? Would it be um, letter E or would it be letter F? Where would we assume the next volcano would be coming up with this plate moving? Turn and talk that out with your partners. Ready, set, go. So we're looking at this line of volcanoes. right here around, um, well, closer, but where letter E would be. And so we know that there's another volcano there. These volcanoes are no longer being fed by the hotspot. If we were to reverse time 
and we were able to get this volcano right here over the hot spot, we would have to move this entire plate back down this way over the hot spot. And then if we wanted to get this volcano to be fed by the hot spot again, we would have to move the plate even further in this direction. That's if we went back in time. If we go forward in time, the plate is continually moving this way in a northwest direction. And so the plate is slowly moving this way. Originally, or rather eventually, this main island is going to be off the volcano or off the hot spot. And then there'll be a new volcano, which is starting right now. So the cool thing about this is these volcanoes now, you cannot see them above the water, but they're below the water. And around 45 to 43 million years ago, there was a shift or a turn in the Pacific plate. It turned, and um, you can see that turn by where um, the volcanoes were. So that's kind of cool. You can track um, the plate motion with old um, island chains. Does that make a little bit more sense? No? Some of you are like, no, it does not. Okay, so then if I wanted this spot right here to be over that hot spot, which direction would I have to go? Push it southeast. I'd have to go southeast. I'd have to push it down that way. But that would be going back in time. So then if I'm going forward in time, I know that it's not going backwards. It's I'm gonna be the, the plate is moving this way. What about you? You're not even looking at me anymore. I just kind of wanted to go over that really briefly because that was one of the things. There was something else that was talked about that I want to do a little demonstration about. There was a part in there I said, like, imagine that you have a balloon on a table. Let's imagine that's our balloon. Let's turn on this little thing and make it glow. Let's imagine that's our balloon. And then it said you put a tablecloth over it. So uh, you tape the balloon in place so the balloon doesn't move. And then you have a tablecloth that you lay over it. So this is supposed to be representing a magma plume or a hot spot, and this represents the crust. Okay, and I was asking you to do a little doodle drawing. I don't like this representation very much only because it looks like there's this, you know, giant bulge that's pushing the crust and making a, a mount like that. That's not what's happening. What will happen is this will all be kind of like level, and you will have, you know, that kind of underneath it. But it, it, it's whatever. So what they asked then was, imagine that there was a volcano that is currently over that hot spot, kind of like this volcano right here. So if I put a volcano there, and then it says, drag the tablecloth. So imagine I'm taking the crust and I'm moving the crust slowly off of that hot spot. It's the crust that moves, not the hot spot. Now this volcano is no longer being fed. Now this volcano um, starts and is over um, the hot spot. So now we've got this volcano um, being fed. Of course, it's still slowly over millions of years. The crust continues to move. And eventually, this is no longer on that hot spot. And now we've got this volcano being created. And that's what was going on here with all of these mountains that are all volcanoes. Now, these are extinct or dead volcanoes because there's no magma chamber underneath them anymore. And so it's just kind of continually moving and moving along. You got me? Fabulous. Another way that we can look at that is by this candle. I'm going to go ahead and use this candle as um, my hot spot. And I'm going to use this paper as an example for my crust. So again, the hot spot stays center, and it's just the paper. Can you turn it this way, darling? It's just the paper that is then moving over, over um, the hot spot. And so as the paper moves over the hot spot, depending on the movement of the crust, depending on the movement of the crust, we can then go ahead and track um, where that movement was, just kind of like this. So imagine that this is the crust and all of these are little volcanoes, right? It's the paper or the crust that moves the hot spot stays center. That's what I wanted to show you about that. All right, let's go ahead and look at, oh, let's take our little quiz. It's only four, um, four points. For those of you that are at home, you're just going to sit tight while we take this little quiz and then we'll come back and take some notes. So fast forward if you're at home through this part.
If you could please close your notebooks, I would greatly appreciate that. Again, this quiz is only on plate boundaries. What are the plates that we have? What are the boundaries, rather? Convergent. What's the motion of the plates at a convergent? Going towards each other. They're coming towards each other. They're colliding. What's another one? Transform. Okay, transform. How are the plates moving? Sliding against each other. They're not moving towards or away. They're sliding. And what's the last one? Divergent. And divergent, what's happening? Moving They're dividing or moving away. All right, so please make sure that your voices are off. Does it? I like that smell of. Put your name on it, and when you're done, please make sure that you bring it up here. Flip Thank it you. over. You're welcome, because it's nobody else's business. And then um, just put it by the glowing moon if you would like to or could do that for me. I greatly appreciate it. Upside down, please, so that it is private to you. Could you switch it a little bit on the senators? You. Thank you. All right, easy peasy, multiple choice, no big deal. If you don't do well on this, I've already started writing a retake. You can come in tomorrow during uh, Liberty Time if you don't do well. Okay, I don't want to know what other people next to you know, I want to know what you know. And if you don't know it, that's okay. It gives us the opportunity to learn it. She's nice. Okay. Hey, Kylie. Logan, make sure you're not jeopardizing your success on your phone. All right, let's fill out our table of contents, our TOC, so that good students become great students. Organized students. So get your stuff. Piece of gum. So you guys, it's trapped. They ratted you out. I'm out. Well, she didn't Thank you. Thank you. I'll grade these, get them in the grade book by tonight, and you'll be able to know if you want to come in and ask me for a pass to Liberty Time uh, tomorrow. Don't forget, there is no Liberty Time today. There is no advisory today um, because teachers have meetings at 3 o'clock that we have to go to. Yay! Teachers.
That's why you have early out so that we we still work from three until four. You do. That's my point. Yeah. Uh, really? Become a teacher. What do you think we did yeah. on Thursdays? I don't know. I don't really know. But I thought early out. out. Mm, we don't get that. And how do we have basketball practice? I don't know. Like we don't use our basketball coach. I know. <laughs> Let's go ahead and go to one. He's there at the meeting sometimes. One slash twelve is today. I believe that this is going to be on page thirty-five. And today we are doing notes. And the notes are going to be called. Um, they're just volcano notes. Notes on volcanoes. Oops, I guess I can get my compass rose down. <laughs> Did you fill out your TOC? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Don't forget, like, your peer share partners are not the people that you constantly talk to. Let's do it. Well, I want you to work with your actual peer share partner. All right, let's go ahead and do this. Volcanoes in your um, community, because right now we're going to be learning. Hey, put your phone away, man. Oh, my bad. I'm sorry. Right now we're going to be learning about the different kinds of volcanoes that we have. It's not just enough for you to say, yeah, they're volcanoes that play boundaries. Now I want you to know um, the differences. So the first thing I want us to know is where do we find most volcanoes? Don't write anything down yet. Where are most volcanoes found? We do have a lot at the Ring of Fire. Why is this called the Ring of Fire? Because it looks like a ring. Yeah, because there's lots of volcanoes all the way around there. Okay, It's ringed. It's an area. The Pacific Plate is ringed um, by volcanoes. And we can see that. All right, so under the sea, this is the first thing that you're going to fill out. Does everybody have a pencil? Great. Please write down divergent boundaries. Places away from plate boundaries, we find them at hot spots. Is that still recording? Yeah. You don't need to weigh in on everything. <laughs> All right, so this is a picture of divergent plate boundaries. This makes sense. If we pull this crust apart, just like if your skin gets pulled apart, you're going to have blood coming up through. This is going to be magma that comes up through that broken crust. And we can see that this is what's called normal faulting. I don't get to teach you that anymore, but this is a normal fault. And when this happens and the crust pulls apart, you get what are called fault block mountains. And there's tensional forces. It's like if you pull a uh, tug of war, you're creating tension on um, the rope. That's what forces are at play on a divergent boundary. This is, of course, a hot spot like the Hawaiian mountains, uh, the Hawaiian uh, islands. So it's fixed. The hot spot doesn't move. It's the crust that moves over it. All right. Ocean volcanoes are most common on our planet. So if we look at all the volcanoes on our planet, most of them are ocean volcanoes. Do you see where to write down common? They are less violent. That's because of the magma. And I'm going to teach you about that tomorrow as far as the magma. The magma is very what's called felsic. It's got a high silica content. Um, they are forming in linear patterns. And we can see a linear pattern right here. It's a line. Which means that you're not going to get volcanoes just kind of like this going to get volcanoes like this and most of the time they're following uh, the plate boundary. They're able to form islands such as Iceland and Hawaii and this is what Hawaii is and there's a picture of Iceland. And you can see the big rifting or ripping of divergent boundary right there. Good? All right, on land, they form at plate boundaries. Usually we see them along coastlines.
They can also form at hot spots. I'm gonna just bring up a picture. So these kinds of volcanoes are much more dangerous or violent. They also form in linear patterns. But these, unlike Hawaiian islands, which are called shield volcanoes, these are called stratocones or composite cone volcanoes, and these are incredibly dangerous. When these explode, they go off like an incredible boom, and you'll get lots of damage. Uh, Mount St. Helens is located here. These are volcanoes that have been active in the past, and the gold are ones that are potentially to be active. So along the coast um, of our country on the west coast, we have a lot, especially the northwest, you've got a lot of volcanoes. Anybody been to like Seattle, Washington State? Me either. To what? Oregon. So Oregon is in that area? All right, we're gonna learn about how they form. We're gonna learn about subduction zone volcanoes, hotspot volcanoes, and rift, bone vo rift zone volcanoes. The first we're gonna look at are volcanoes that happen at rift zones. So at a rift zone, think rift or rip. These are divergent plates moving apart and they form a rift valley. Divergent plates can occur on land or ocean, and this is where magma rises up through the broken crust. Just like your skin bleeds, I guess you can think of the Earth's skin as the crust, and magma will come up if it's cracked. Examples are the East African Rift Valley, Mount Kilimanjaro. This is Mount Kilimanjaro. Mount Kilimanjaro is what's called a composite cone or stratovolcano. It's very steep sided, whereas a shield volcano, like the, volca the volcanic islands, are very, very um, wide. This is the dangerous kind of volcano. I mean, all volcanoes are dangerous if you fall into them, right? But if you go to Hawaii, I mean, you can see the magma oozing, but it's a slow kind of ooze. It's always releasing pressure. Pressure's not building up. This thing, think about like a cap on top of a soda you shake it, and then when you pop it, it just kind of goes everywhere. That's this kind of volcano. All right, subduction zones. This is where most of the world's land volcanoes um, are created from. Many are found in the ring of fire which surrounds the Pacific Ocean. And it's fire only because they're all volcanoes. This is where the East African Rift Zone is. I want to show you that. Um, the Red Sea is right here. It's already opened up enough and the ocean has fall, uh, came in. You can see that this also is rifting. We've got volcanoes out through here. So eventually this will continue to separate and open up and then this little piece of land will just be separate from Africa. All right, so subduction happens at convergent plate boundaries where the dense oceanic plate goes under the less dense plate. I'm gonna show a picture of this while we're talking. So the oceanic plate, as it's diving or ducking or subducting down, is going into an area of the planet that's super hot. So the crust is gonna melt. And when the crust melts, it becomes less dense because if you heat something, it changes the density, becomes less dense. And so then this crust, as it melts, then starts rising up through the cracks on the plate that did not subduct. Why did the plate get cracks? Because as this thing is shoving itself underneath this um, plate, it's causing an awful lot of pressure and stress, and so it bends that rock and it causes lots of cracks. There's lots of areas or faults where magma can rise up through. Situation like this would be um, on the coast of South America and the Andes Mountains. All right, we're gonna look at hot spots. There's a lot of hot spots um, in the world that we just don't ever hear about. A small percentage of the world's volcanoes are hot spots.
They're found most often in the interior of the plate, not at the plate boundaries, although they can be at the plate boundaries too. You writing this stuff down, man? These right here are um, old um, basalt lava flows. This I believe is called the Siberian Flats. And for millions of years back in the distant past, there was big rifts that opened up and lots of magma just poured and poured out throughout this region. All right, examples in the United States are Hawaii or Yellowstone. You can write down both examples or just one if you want. Magma punches through the moving plate above, leaving a linear pattern of volcanoes. And as we showed earlier, you can actually track the movement of the plate by looking at these um, past volcanoes. So you've got this large amount, this large plume of magma that comes up, pushing the crust. You've got fault block mountains that are being uh, created. All right. This is the plate motion of North America moving in this general direction. These um, super volcanoes, this is a super volcano right here. This is the, this is Wyoming and if you can see on the edge of Wyoming, this whole space right here is a volcano. It's like huge. It went off between 2 million and 600 uh, mil, uh, thousand years ago and it's gonna go off again. It usually is supposed to go off about every 600,000 years. I want to show you Yellowstone. Is it going to go off again? Yes. Will it affect us in Iowa? Yellowstone yes. National Park but contains one of our country's our favorite landmarks. But it's actually a warning signal going off every hour. Now we're going. Anybody been to Yellowstone? Have you? Wow. So the geyser is just water, and it's this like if you boil water baseball. in a tea kettle, and eventually it whistles, and you get steam coming out, that's what they call That's geyser. what's happening here. Just pressure what we're building up from water on the ground. What we're water and steam so blowing hot. out of the ground. It's been doing this for 100 years plus, and it's a really reliable tourist attraction because the thing goes off like it's clockwork. It's one of the most powerful geysers in the world capable of shooting 8,500 gallons of superheated water as high as an 18-story building. It's a constant reminder that lurking beneath the surface is a ticking time bomb. You see, although it may not seem like it, I'm actually standing on top of a volcano. And park geologist Hank Giesler wants to show me what it looks like underground. So they're gonna show you the magma chamber. This is a magma chamber a mass of semi-molten rock reaching almost 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the powerhouse of a volcano. That's uh, one of the largest chambers that have been mapped in the world. Wow. But can we agree that we'd like to keep it down there? I don't think we have a choice. <laughs> it's going to do what it wants to do. Together with a second recently discovered magma chamber, there's enough partially molten rock under Yellowstone to fill the Grand Canyon 13 times over. And scientists believe below them lies a mantle plume, a column channeling heat from the Earth's core, melting the rocks above and creating the massive magma chambers under Yellowstone. If this supervolcano ever erupted, we'd be in trouble. There's a place in Nebraska where you can see just how bad things could get. Inside this plain steel barn is a 12 million year old animal Pompeii. So this is in uh, Nebraska. There used to be just like a field there. Well, I mean, obviously plains. And all of these animals just got covered up by ash and died. And we're talking Here are the fossilized skeletons of, of 200 ash. animals, mostly rhinos and horses, lie frozen in the exact position in which they died. The man who discovered this site is paleontologist Mike Voorhees. All volcanic we found ash. remains of, of more than 50 species of animals, 
12 million years ago, our wildlife was similar in richness to the East African savannas of today. The gray dust that entombs these animals is what killed them, ash, from a massive volcanic eruption. There was so much of it that the air was polluted and animals had to breathe dust for weeks and weeks and weeks and they ended up dying by the thousands. And the mantle plumes that we think made this supervolcano is still around. Our continent has been sliding over this hot spot, which has triggered numerous eruptions, and now it sits beneath Yellowstone. So the plume under our most famous national park is a repeat offender that will strike again. It's hard to imagine that much volcanic ash, and yet we know that this kind of an event has happened before, and almost certainly it will happen again. A super eruption in Yellowstone would be a really bad day for North America. As a geologist, I'd love to see this thing erupt. But as a North American, not so much. It would rank as the most violent event since humans first set foot on the continent. If you think about it, our weather moves from west to east. And so if you want to find out what kind of weather we're having, you always kind of look towards the west of us in the area of like California. And so then it's moving this way, right? All the weather storm does. So Yellowstone is to the west of us. So if Yellowstone goes off over here and I was over there, all that ash goes up and it travels this way. They think it's going to travel so far up into the atmosphere that it'll actually circle the globe. And what it'll do is it'll reflect the sunlight of our, um, of our sun from our planet, and then we'll go into what's called a nuclear winter. Has somebody ever heard of a nuclear winter? Yeah, what do you know about it? It's very cold. Very, very cold. Dark. Yeah, very cold and very dark, and that might happen for months. It might happen for years. We don't know, but for sure, the globe um, temperature is going to go down. Plus, everything's going to be covered with ash. So any kind of agriculture we have, especially in our area, the Midwest is like the breadbasket of the world, is going to be just decimated. And so that's probably what's going to kill people, right? For sure, the people in Wyoming are going to be dead, right? They're going to not make it immediately. But then for the rest of us, it's going to be like a slow, can we make it? Can we get enough food? Do we have clean water? All of that kind of stuff that we have to worry about for the next years. So what will probably happen, and has happened in the past with areas um, for you know, super tragic events, is you have the population like this, this is the population, and then you have a large event that happens worldwide, and the population dies off to a smaller population of people that then repopulate the world in the future, and then you get another larger population. And things like this have happened a lot. It's called a bottleneck. And so you get like our population, something terrible happens like the bubonic plague, and then everything, you know, a whole bunch of people die. And so what you're doing is you're really getting rid of a lot of the diversity. So you right now, the reason you're here is because your ancestors made it, right? Your ancestors made it through and that's why you're here. So you are here because people before you didn't get killed. <laughs> You know, that's, that's it. I mean, you are very lucky to be in the place that you are today. I'm very lucky to be in the place that I am today because my ancestors made it through, you know, whatever terrible events happened in the world. And then eventually, you know, we get here. Evolution is easy. When you get to biology, evolution is just a species or an animal or a thing living long enough to have sex and have babies. And then once your babies are moving on, that's evolution. If you die before you have babies, your genetics dies with you. And that part of whatever it was didn't get passed on. I mean, that's just kind of the way it is. That's why giraffes have long necks. It's not like the long neck giraffe stretch. It's just like the long neck giraffes were the only ones that could reach the leaves. So they lived. You know, you don't see any short little neck. It's like if you're in the Arctic, and in the Arctic, if this is the Arctic, the color of the Arctic is white, and you are a bunny rabbit, and you're like a brown, that's a terrible bunny rabbit, Mrs. Ukraine. If you're a little bunny rabbit, and you are a black bunny rabbit, what's going to happen to you? No, you're going to get eaten. Because you're going to be easy to see, and people are going to eat you. And so you're not going to be able to have sex and have more black bunny rabbits, right? And so then you don't get to live. 
the white bunny rabbits, can you see them? They're all over the place. Can you see those white bunny rabbits? No, because they're camouflaged for the environment that they are in. And so they are able to have sex and have babies, and then you see, you know, those are the ones that move on. We're gonna finish this. To what, how much time do we have? Do we have more time? No, we got like. No, shut up. Do we, we have more like time? One minute. Minute. Four minutes. Four minutes. All right, let's go ahead and flip this paper over. <laughs> All right. The type of volcanic landforms depends on the magma chemical composition. So Asa earlier when he was talking about chemical composition, it's all about the magma's chemical composition. And it depends on the silica content. I want you to write that down. Silica. Silica is just like sand, right? Silica SI. I think we had you look that up um, yesterday. Maybe, I'm guessing, atomic number of 14 or something. This affects what's called viscosity. Has anybody heard of this word, viscosity? What do you know about it, Will? It is how thick Yeah, how thick, right? It, it describes a fluid's resistant to flow. If something's got a high viscosity, it means it's got a high resistance to flow. Think about honey. Honey, if you tip it over, it doesn't come out very easy. If something's got a low viscosity, think water, low with the W, if you tip it over, it's going to pour right out. It's got a very low resistance to flow. It flows really easy. We will stop there. Yeah, could you please shut that off, please, for me in the video? Thank you, darling.